The simple fact that there was food available on the ground appears to have been the force that drove the evolution of bonobos. Wrangham believes the catalyst was a long-lasting drought two million years ago in what is now Zaire. The plants and the gorillas that depended on them died. It was tough on the chimpanzees, but they could live on the fruit and the trees. When the rains and the plants returned, the gorillas didn't. Now the chimpanzees could get to the food on the ground. In time, they evolved into bonobos. It's been suggested that same drought forced our ancestors out of East Africa's forests and onto the plains. And once you had drying in a savanna area, then conditions became quite harsh. It was impossible for early humans to travel around in groups together in the way that bonobos do, and therefore for females to form alliances and dominate the males in the way that happens in bonobos. But a little bit different climatic history, a little bit different in our food history, and we might have evolved to be a totally different, more peaceful, less violent, more sexual species. Today, this theory is little more than interesting speculation. But the idea behind it is consistent with a growing but controversial body of scientific thought that claims much of present-day human behavior is rooted in our distant past. There's a new group of scientists called evolutionary psychologists, and they're interested in how human evolutionary history affects the way we think today. Now keep in mind that that means four million years of evolutionary history, a time during which we were almost always roaming the plains and forests of Africa. How does that affect the way we operate today? They've been looking at things like mate choice, different kinds of uh, standards of beauty, social exchange, and they have a very long way to go before they can prove some of their ideas, but they're still some of the most interesting and provocative issues around today. Evolutionary psychologists begin by pointing out that, regardless of the culture in which we grow up, we all tend to respond the same way to a surprising variety of things. Most of us find spiders unpleasant, certain body types sexy, and particular smells disgusting. All, they say, are legacies of our evolutionary past. If we ask, for example, do rotten eggs smell bad? It's just a molecule, hydrogen sulfide gas. It doesn't have the smell. We have evolved a brain to generate a negative feeling for something that's detrimental to our gene survival. This indicates biological contamination, right? If you were a dung beetle, the smell of rotten eggs might smell wonderful to you because the smell doesn't reside in the molecule. It resides in the evolved brain. To an evolutionary psychologist, it's no accident Hollywood turns to snakes when it wants to put a hero in danger. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? Dangerous snakes don't slither into most of our lives. Still, more than a few of us share Indiana Jones's instinctual fear. You go first. Another deeply embedded instinct we may have inherited from our ancestors is the ability to smell a genetically compatible mate. In one unusual experiment, scientists had young men sleep in the same t-shirt for a couple of nights until the shirts were infused with their unique smell. It turns out, when women were asked to rate the sex appeal of the different men based only on the smell of the shirts, they consistently rated higher the shirts of men whose immune genes were unlike their own. From an evolutionary perspective, this makes sense. Choosing a mate with different immune genes gives offspring a greater protection against viruses, parasites, and other pathogens. The ability to smell good genes is a remarkable talent. But like most instincts, we don't even know it's at work. We just like the way someone smells, or the way they look, or because they make us laugh. People don't have sex because they want to perpetuate their genes. They don't like someone because they want to get better genes. 
They do things because they feel good to them. They have sex because it feels good. The relationship between those good feelings and gene survival may not even be known to them. They never think about that. They do things because it feels good, and they never think, why do those things feel good? Why have we evolved a brain that makes certain things feel bad to us or certain things feel good to us? And that's the question that we're addressing. Like many men, Victor Johnston spends as much time as he can looking at beautiful women. But for Johnston, it's an academic pursuit, part of his effort to understand the evolutionary roots of beauty. You have to remember that beauty is a bit like sugar. In a hunter-gatherer world, the source of sugar was ripe fruit. So if you like the taste of sugar, you got a very nutritional diet. And now we've separated the sugar from the nutrient, the sugar's actually killing us. It's, it's bad for us. And yet we still have this preference for it. Well, beauty may be something the same. Beauty's just a configuration of facial cues that we find to be attractive. These are cues that are telling us something about that individual, something biologically important. People like very full lips, and these are due to estrogens at puberty. And they also like females with short lower jaws and narrow lower jaws. And this indicates a low testosterone level. And those, that combination of high estrogens and low testosterone is correlated with fertility. In a hunter-gatherer world, it was important to detect these cues. But in today's world, you know, we can manipulate fertility. We have fertility drugs and contraception. It doesn't have the same importance, but we still react to it. It still affects our behavior. The next face I want you to find, Sarah, is the face that would be the most attractive male face. Woohoo! Mm -hmm. The most attractive male. Yeah, the most attractive male Should face from this people. range of faces. To study facial preferences, Johnston constructed a computer program that scrolls seamlessly between a sexy, fertile female face and a macho, virile male face. That guy looks like he's <laughs> right out of prison. He's not he's very gonna popular. Hold up the, yeah, he's not very popular. I'd like for you to find the best possible mate for a short-term relationship. Short -term. Okay. okay. A secret weekend. <laughs> Tends to be more masculine and pretty far down there. <laughs> for a short-term mate, are. they want someone who's got a lot of testosterone markers on their face compared with a choice for a long-term mate. So whenever people are looking for good genes or a short-term relationship, they seem to be looking for these more masculine characteristics, but not so when they're looking for a long-term mate. They're looking for maybe a softer, kinder person for a long-term relationship. Maybe someone that's kind of a little bit protective, help me out, watch over us. Johnston tested many of his subjects more than once. To his surprise, he sometimes got different answers on different days. When was the first day of bleeding for your last period? Oh, it turns out that when women are ovulating and the chances of getting pregnant are high, okay. there's a consistent shift in what they find They're attractive toward a more masculine-looking male. I want someone a Least Just like with the songbirds, that's when the unconscious lure of those good genes is strongest. There, that's the one. Of all the claims of evolutionary psychology, none are more sweeping than Jeffrey Miller's. He believes the human brain, like the peacock's magnificent tail, is an extravagance that evolved, at least in part, to help us attract a mate and pass on genes. The human brain is the most complex system in the known universe. It's wildly in excess of what it seems like we would need to survive on the plains of Africa. In fact, the human brain seems so excessive that a lot of people who believe in evolution applied to plants and animals have real trouble imagining how natural selection produced the human brain. All the other species on the planet seem to get by with relatively small, simple nervous systems that seem tightly optimized just to do what the species needs to do to get by. I think people are perfectly sensible in being skeptical about the ability of, of selection for survival to account for the human brain. I think there was a sort of guidance happening. There was a sort of decision-making process that was selecting our brains. But it wasn't God, it was our ancestors. They were choosing their sexual partners for their brains, for their behavior during courtship. 